it's a little unwise and sometimes dangerous to speculate what would David have said about that? But you can't help but think about that in terms of the Brexit story because he would have been absolutely outspoken in his contempt for the worst aspects of the European venture, namely its over-dependence on a TTIP-style, a globalization-style of economy where increased homogenization becomes the order of the day, people's individual identities in increasingly con conforming communities would be set aside and so on. And all of that stuff he absolutely hated, but he loved Europe. He just loved the idea of, of Europe. He he, you know, if anybody would have stood so up and said, I am a European, it would, be, it would have been David. And that conflict going on in people when they think about the European vote is a very interesting story, and there are, we've got a lot to learn from that. But he would have been particularly trenchant about the ways in which we've lost that notion of what community means to people. Very, very critical of how we've developed things like multiculturalism, about which he had a particular bee in his bonnet because he saw it as a tool to persuade people that it was okay that we would learn to live together, whatever the diversity, whatever the numbers of people that we had to embrace and absorb into our, our own economy today, we'd somehow come through it with a little bit of slapped-on multiculturalism. And, of course, for him, that was just denying what community is all about because it seemed to indicate that you could just intervene in such a way that people's sense of who they are in a community could be engineered to embrace the arrival of very large numbers of people who might not have any cultural connectivity with an individual in his or her community at this stage. You can see why that kind of idea was quite controversial and difficult for a lot of people in the Green Party to deal with because it seems to imply that maybe we have to think very carefully about uh, open borders approach, freedom of movement. How do you maintain cultural and community cohesion whilst being true to the highest ideals that you might have about ensuring that richer countries can work effectively to help poorer countries, can maintain a commitment to human rights um, in a very troubled world. How do we do that? And we don't do it well, is the truth of it. And one of the reasons why we're in our Brexit mess at the moment is that we haven't done that well for decades in this country, and many people felt that in the run-up to the actual uh, vote itself. That's why his writing is always going to be uncomfortable for a lot of people, because it isn't really the way progressive politics seeks to find answers to the problems that we face today. And I'm very involved in post-Brexit progressive political initiatives at the moment. I'm involved in two of these right now and spending a lot of time doing that stuff. And I'm often thinking to myself, hmm, not sure that David would be very happy sitting in this room right now because it doesn't really answer the deeper questions that he was asking the whole time. It's really the first thing I've been asked to vote on as a, as a member of the electorate that I didn't immediately have a clear opinion on. And I, yeah, I could see both sides. I mean, as a, as a sort of coming from a transition background, I thought, well, I'm, I'm really interested in, in bringing things back to local control and to, to um, localising. Um, I found it very interesting that lots of my sort of green lefty friends found it completely obvious that we should stay in and completely obvious that Scotland should leave the UK. And I'd often ask, well, why, why the distinction and, and not get that clear answers? Um, and I also started thinking about what I've, what I've started calling... Um, Guy exit, you know, Gaia exit, because that's really, that I'm very clear on. I'd quite like us to have a continued existence on the planet. And, um, and I started th listening to some of the debates that people were having in that context, because I think at the global scale, there's a sort of immigration issue too. Um, there's a sort of border between the as yet unborn people and those of us who are already here. And, um, you know, I'd hear Nigel Farage saying, well, we can't possibly let more people in. It's completely... And I think, well, yeah, on a global scale, I can kind of see where you're coming from. You know, should we be excluding some of these as yet unborn people from immig immigration to the planet? Um, should we be accepting that some of the life forms that are already here, particularly non-human life forms, are being forced to emigrate from the planet in order to make room for them? Um, and I found that quite an interesting, useful um, lens to view it through. And then after the vote, 
I found it quite horrible, the, the division that the media have been, like the idea that everyone who voted out is just a racist or an idiot, mm. um, I, I find completely wrong. Um, and, uh, and I mean, there's a, there's a place called St. Ethelburgers, which is a church in London, who their response to the Brexit vote I thought was wonderful. They held open listening days um, where people could just come and say what they were feeling and people didn't respond and people didn't argue, but just everyone there could say what they were feeling. And I think this recreation of community and of, of solidarity in the nation is, is an incredibly important response. Um, and so on that, I mean, I've found David's work strangely. I mean, he, he died five years before um, the Brexit vote. Um, but strangely, some of his writing, which I've obviously been very embedded in recently, has really helped me to understand. And there's an entry, there's a section here in his entry on nation, um, which I'd like to read. He says, a nation has an identity which connects the people who live there to a particular place and to each other. There is a landscape which many generations have shaped and defended, and there is an endowment of culture, language, and institutions which, though they can be betrayed, cannot be denied. The nation is a located, bounded, particular homeland, and if defeated, it often manages eventually to come back into being with a sense of renewal and justice. It exists in the minds of its people. Identity in this collective sense means that there is an identifiable meaning to the idea of we. And that, I think, that sense of identity is something that a lot of people who voted out have talked about. Uh, that's the EU threatens that, you know, who, who, what is it to be British? What is it to be English? Is the EU just trying to take that away? Um, and I think David writes beautifully about that. And then in terms of the, the question we had about sort of where do we go from here? Um, I mean, I think a lot of the sort of unpredicted election results that we've seen recently, whether it's Corbyn invected as Labour leader or whether it's Trump in America or whether it's Brexit, we can see as a, as a, as a no you know, as a rejection of the mainstream. I, I, I sort of look at Brexit and think, wow, so all the main parties agreed that we should vote one way, and that seems to have pretty much guaranteed that we'd vote the other, because we're, like, rejecting the mainstream. And I think the, the sort of global neoliberal agenda is not just, you know, something <laughs> with terrible consequences in the future, but this sort of neo-feudalism called austerity is, is, is driving people into the ground now. You know, there's a, there's a real desperation there from a lot of people. Um, and this is why I've been, another reason I'm so proud to work on these books, because I think, you know, a lot of people have talked about the threat of fascism rising in times like this. Um, but if we look at the likes of Mussolini and Hitler, they didn't just come to power on, a, on an agenda of, of fear and othering. Um, they also raised wages and addressed unemployment and improved working conditions. And I think if that's seen as the only alternative to what we currently have, then it's likely to grow in, in support. It's likely to be supported and voted in. Um, whereas I think what David lays out, for me at least, is the most inspiring, compelling vision of what an alternative e economics could look like um, that provides a, a beautiful story of how we, how we help the desperate rather than that sort of rather despicable um, vision. His, his economics is based on sort of trust and loyalty and local diversity. So for me, the we thing now is really critical because we can't ignore rethinking what it means to find ourselves now with not much sense of who the we is in England. There's a much more sense of we in Scotland and a we in Wales and even to, uh, certainly in Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, but even in Northern Ireland, there's more of a sense of we. We, we don't do that. We don't know quite how to do that for England. And we're very nervous because as soon as you start thinking, what we really need is an English parliament. And then you think, oh God, Oh God, what have I just said? Am I, am I streaming Farage? Have I just suddenly <laughs> fallen into a dreadful time warp so that I'm just a, I'm a kind of proto UKIPper posturing as a green? And um, um, we're, so, we're so scared about the fact that UKIP got some things right about identity and about community and about how we need to live together that we don't know. <laughs> We're just, we're just so buttoned up, we can't talk about this. I see the current way that border controls are managed as being inherently racist and morally indefensible. I don't see any reason why where you're born should determine where you're allowed to live, fundamentally. At the same time, on the other hand, well, I'll read you a bit from David. Um, and so he, 
drew a lot on the work of Ellen Ostrom, um, the late Nobel Prize winning economist uh, who did a huge amount of work on the commons and the importance of the commons. Um, and I'm increasingly interested in this because it seems to me that if the left is obsessed with the state and the right is obsessed with the markets and corporations, I'm not really on board with either of those. Um, and this idea of community and commons seems to me to be um, a lot more interesting. So David, drawing on Eleanor Ostrom, says that closed access is a necessary condition for the management of a commons. With limited numbers of people within its boundaries, the demands made on it too are limited, making them realistic and sustainable. The members of any managed commons must undertake to comply with the rules necessary for its maintenance. It follows that they must exclude others who do not comply with those rules or whose demands would exceed the limits of what it can supply. The principle underlying this is known as subtractivity or rivalness, the idea that what one person harvests from a resource subtracts from the ability of others to do the same. There is a simple recognition here of the objective reality of the resource. It has its limits and no amount of technical trickery or emotional pleading can make that fact go away. Recognising subjectivity is a case of growing up, as in realising that the powers of your parents to provide are not unlimited. Moving on from the child think of unqualified confidence that the political economy you live in can provide. The alternative is the tragedy of the commons, and he, he writes a lot about the tragedy of the commons and how in fact it's the tragedy of the market-based commons, because historically all commons were made up of people who knew each other and, and talked to each other, and if someone started exploiting it, they'd quickly be told off or run out of town. Um, only in a market where everyone's atomized does the tragedy of the commons even, even come into existence. Um, but this is the case of the destruction of a common resource as individuals make ever greater demands on it, benefiting from what they can get individually, but not seeing as their problem the damage done by those ever greater demands to the commons as a whole. In a society used to cheap travel and to the idea that destruction, when it comes to boundaries and the rhetoric about tearing down barriers, is a good thing, the idea of closed access at first invites unease. There is a sense both of being locked in and of unfairly locking out. But in fact, it works the other way. Almost wherever you go in the market economy, you find yourself in the same place. In the globalised market, with its shared banality, its fullness, at the end of every lane is a busy road and a housing estate like the one at the beginning of it. You cannot get out of a globalised world because there is no out. Closed access does not mean closed in, it means the protection of distinctiveness. When you are out, you are somewhere else, in a different inn. And so this for me has been really interesting because I've got so frustrated with the level of debate around Brexit and it's just been like, well, you're a racist, well, you're an idiot. And I'm like, so for me, there's a real difficult tension here to deal with between the fact that I see border controls as they currently are as just completely indefensible and the fact that there is a need to limit movement in some way. And what I find really inspiring about David's work is that his idea of limiting movement is to make people love the place that they're in. Mm -hmm. So you're not saying you can't come here. You're, you're helping people to say, well, why would I want to leave this place that I love? This approach seems to me to make sense. And the, the, the level of problem that we have now is, again, a product of this, this neoliberal market-based economy, which is increasingly destroying the communities of places and the sustainability of places so that people have to leave and go somewhere else and thus potentially overwhelm that other place. But at the same time, we shouldn't get caught up in our opposition to border xenophobia and forget that there are limits to growth, you know, that actually places can't take an infinite influx, even though we might wish that they could. He, he ab absolutely acknowledges that um, the, the seeds of that community integration have been under assault um, for, for centuries, really, and that the, the formal market economy has increasingly replaced the... Uh, actually, there is a section I could read on this. Um, has, has really replaced that, um, that sense of, of, of community ethic. So he's talking about economics and, and growth-based <laughs> economics. He says, the reduction of a society and a culture to dependence on mathematical abstraction has infantilized a grown-up civilization and is well on the way to destroying it. Civilizations self-destruct anyway, but it is reasonable to ask whether they have done so before with such enthusiasm, in obedience to such an acutely absurd superstition, while claiming with such insistence that they were beyond being seduced by the irrational promises of religion. Every civilization has had its irrational but reassuring myth. Previous civilizations have used their culture to sing about it and tell stories about it. Ours has used its mathematics to prove it. Yet when this sh relatively short-lived market society is gone, we will miss its essential simplicity, its price mechanism, its self-stabilizing properties, its impersonal exchange, 
the comforts it delivers to many and the freedoms it underwrites, its failure will be destructive. And this is the thing, he, he, he was not saying let's bring down the market-based economy because right now it's all we've got to rely on because we've, we've seen such a disintegration of, of, of culture and community. Um, and besides, he believed it would, it would collapse soon enough anyway, well before we were ready. And so what he advocates is that we spend our time rebuilding the informal economy. Um, and this is why he found transition to be such an inspiring thing because you know, how do we increasingly pull ourselves out of dependence on money um, and into dependence on, on each other? And the more that we can rebuild those, um, <coughs> I mean, he talks about it as a, as a basket. He says, um, culture is like the upright strands that you talk that you begin with when you're making a basket around which you weave the, the outer strands. Um, and uh, without culture, the community has nothing to, to pull itself together with. Um, and so, yeah, really, as, as you'll find as you read on, um, what he would advocate is devote your time to rebuilding those ties of family and those ties of community um, and those creating that identity at the local scale. Because he would say it's not local, local economies that are, that are going to die. It's that the, the globalised economy, which completely relies on those, is, is, is going to collapse. 